This video will present an overview of American foreign policy. By understanding the United States' role in the international world order, we can better understand and predict whether or not the United States will remain the world's sole superpower in the coming decades. Given that this topic is just about the most controversial issue aside from abortion, religion, and pineapple on pizza, I'm bound to piss off a lot of you. Nonetheless, I will try my best to be as objective as possible while trying to break down this incredibly complex topic. If you are expecting a video where I claim that America is the greatest nation in our galactic quadrant of the Milky Way, that has fought for justice, liberty, freedom, and other wonderful things, then this video is probably not for you. And if you think that the US is the spawn of Satan, whose primary geopolitical objective is to carpet bomb every patch of grass, then this video is probably not for you either. If you belong to either of those groups, I suggest leaving this video right now after you write a nice hate comment. Cool, let's get started. Overall, the US benefits from what is called splendid isolation. What this means is that unlike nearly all other great powers, the US developed into a world power in part due to its large geographic distance from other rising powers. I mean, sorry to say this Bahamas, you got some nice beaches, but you're not exactly what I would consider a mighty leviathan. The US is an ocean away from other great powers, both in Europe and Asia. The only place where this state is located near an adversarial superpower is at the Bering Strait between Alaska and Russia's Siberia. But due to its physical remoteness and harsh climate, it's really only fit for muskots. You could probably fit the population of this part of the world within a country kitchen buffet. For this reason, unless crabs become of any strategic importance, it's unlikely that this area will be hotly contested. But with climate change melting and perhaps some discoveries of hydrocarbon resources, this could change. The US also has close proximity to Cuba, which is an adversarial nation ever since the Castro brothers and this pretty guy would overthrow the US-backed dictatorship. Without being a launch pad for Soviet nuclear weapons, as it was during the 1960s, Washington officials aren't exactly trembling in their boots regarding Cuba. The two bordering nations are Canada and Mexico, two relatively weak yet friendly nations that make up its most important trading partners under the NAFTA agreement, as both of them are economic powerhouses. Canada is America's largest trading partner, and the two have close ties in political, economic, and military matters, despite their differences during the Vietnam and Iraq wars, as well as formal relations with Cuba. There's even a conspiracy that Fidel Castro cucked Justin Trudeau's dad, look it up. Ties between the US and Mexico were once highly strained due to, you know, this entire area once being part of Mexico. But nonetheless, relations have improved throughout the 90s and 2000s. Although there have been some downs. The US is home to the largest Mexican diaspora population, who have a profound impact on American culture especially in recent decades, despite calls to build a wall and a moat of snakes and crocodiles. Yeah, that, that's also true, look it up. NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, ensures the logistics and supply routes of resources that are interconnected between the three nations, and this has led to some considerable economic growth and cheaper consumer products, but at the same time has led to many Americans and Mexicans in certain industries to lose their jobs and livelihoods. There have also been some issues regarding exceptions for oil, labor, and apparently Canadian softwood lumber. Even if this trade agreement ended, the logistics and infrastructure set up in place over the past few decades would inhibit any complete disengagement from free trade agreements. Further south lies Latin America, including Mexico. The United States has oftentimes seen this region as its own backyard. After various wars of independence kicked out the Spanish and later the Portuguese, the United States stepped in with the Monroe Doctrine, which stated that the US would intervene in the event that European powers would try to meddle and fuck around in the affairs of the Western Hemisphere. Fucking around with the affairs of the Western Hemisphere was a strictly American job at this point. Well, or at the very least it would be. 
At the time, the U.S. was not a major power, and European nations did indeed mess with Latin American affairs. Over the years, the U.S. would use gunboat diplomacy, foreign aid, and a handful of coups, most notably in Chile, in order to sway its influence in the region. Some of these coups were even at the behest of banana companies. The U.S. had also been active in fighting the war on drugs in the region, most notably in Colombia. Since the 80s, many of these nations have become democratic, and since the collapse of communism, the U.S. has been somewhat neglectful. The U.S. holds close ties with Colombia, Chile, and considers Argentina a major non-NATO ally. It does hold rather poor nations with Nicaragua, Venezuela, and others. Given the constant regime changes in the region, by the time you're watching this, it is likely that much of this has changed and many of the things I've just said are incorrect. Just look at Bolivia. On the other side of the Atlantic lies Europe. Arguably, the most important relationship here is with the UK, in which they hold what Churchill described as a special relationship since World War II. It is rather an unusual quirk of history that once a tiny piss ant colony of England, the United States would rise up to the point of making its former mother nation its borderline de facto vassal state. The two nations cooperate immensely on political, military, economic, scientific, and cultural matters. The UK also has US troops stationed on its territory. The country is armed with nukes and holds veto power at the UN, oftentimes voting alongside the same lines as the US. The US also holds very close relations with France ever since France aided the American War of Independence. Not to mention the fact that they gave the United States this pretty woman on its 100th birthday. The Americans repaid their debt by kicking this asshole out of France a little later on. Overall though, France does maintain a fairly independent foreign policy of the United States even though they tend to agree on more than they disagree. Major issues of difference have tended to be over NATO protocols, the Iraq War, and Freedom Fries, but overall relations are strong. Germany is tied with Britain and France as one of the three main big shots in Western Europe. Now united with far more democracy and far less genocide, Germany makes up the largest economy on the continent and arguably the de facto leader of the European Union on economic and political matters. Germany also maintains very close relations with the US, including being home to numerous US military bases. However, given Germany's less than stellar history of military conduct, Many Germans today are very hesitant to engage in military affairs led by the United States in Iraq and Libya. Germany also has to balance support for Western opposition to Russia's geopolitical sway with its own dependence on Russian natural gas. The last major Western European great power is Italy, which happens to be home to a very large diaspora population in the United States, most notably New York City. Italian culture has had a massive role in shaping American culture and everything from food, music to Joe Pesci. Despite being at war during World War II, Italy has been a close ally of the United States and a NATO member throughout much of the Cold War and past then. The US also maintains bilateral relations with Vatican City, which is not a member of the UN or EU or NATO. Not being part of NATO is a shame since it would have been cool to see those Swiss guards in combat again. Granted, those purple and orange pants probably aren't best suited for cameo. Washington DC has an embassy in Vatican City. I've been there and pretty much half of the entire country is made up of embassies. The US is a secular democracy but holds the fourth largest number of Catholics in the world after Brazil, Mexico, and the Philippines. Despite the US being a secular democracy and the Holy See being a theocracy, the two have coordinated heavily, particularly in the opposition to communism during the Cold War. Relations are fairly warm. However, there are differences. Vatican City tends to take issue with some of the excesses of American military intervention, 
while the U.S. has problems with all the priests diddling children. As most of you know, many of these nations, tribes, ethnic groups, and empires were killing each other ever since the ice thawed. In the aftermath of World War II, the U.S. pushed a number of European countries to integrate their economies and to sign a defense pact called NATO. This organization first started with the U.S., Canada, and a small handful of European nations, but has continued to expand to most of Europe, including a number of Eastern European countries that border Putin's lair. The primary purpose of NATO was to keep the Americans in Europe, the Russians out of Europe, and the Germans down. That last part about keeping Germany down is less relevant today, but the part about keeping the Americans in and the Russians out is as relevant as ever. The most important aspect of this agreement is Article 5, which states that an attack on one country would be an attack on all. Today, this threat primarily refers to the circumstance in which Russia may invade an Eastern European country that is a member of NATO, such as Estonia. In this case, the article would come into full force, as was done in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks which prompted the war in Afghanistan. In the aftermath of World War II, the US also initiated the Marshall Plan, which is basically a plan that involves inundating European countries with tons of aid on the pretense that they would not devolve into communism. This in many ways was a brilliant strategy as it helped to rebuild many of the nations that were in shambles after the war, but it was also a strategic advantage for the US as these newly improved economies in Europe would be great export markets for American products ranging from Ford Mustangs to McNuggets. Over the course of the years, many European nations have cooperated in American-led military interventions like in the Korean War, Gulf War, Bosnia Crisis, Kosovo War, Afghanistan, Libya, and to a lesser extent, Vietnam and Iraq. The belief that a strong relationship between the US and Europe is beneficial to both and has fostered world stability is called Atlanticism, which has remained very popular in capitals on both sides of the pond. Russia, on the other hand, is arguably the US's largest geopolitical adversary. And while its power has declined since the collapse of the Soviet Union, it has managed to improve its economy and strengthen its military power since the days of not having a president who spent most of his time shit-faced. For a brief period of time after the Cold War, American-Russian relations were actually really good. Just look how happy Clinton and Yeltsin look. After the collapse of communism, NATO membership did expand eastward, including many of the countries that were once part of Soviet influence, or in the case of the Baltic states, part of the Soviet Union itself. Relations with Russia are frosty as they've ever been since the post-Cold War era started. Tensions first built up during the Bosnian-Kosovo conflicts in 1995 and 1999, in which Moscow was supporting the Serbs, while NATO forces were supporting the opposition. Relations warmed up after 9-11 as Russia has also been a major target of Islamic terrorist attacks. However, relations have continued to decline ever since the attacks on Georgia and Ukraine. Tensions probably led to a boil during the annexation of Crimea, in which Russia took over this area in order to gain access to warm water ports. While the United States and Russia kind of hate each other on Earth, they get along pretty well in space. South to Europe lies the Middle East, a region rich in crude oil, natural gas, and sectarian violence. It's also the region that the US has been the most heavily involved in when it comes to military adventures in the past half century. Before the Cold War, American military presence in the Middle East was very minor. Nonetheless, the first nation to formally recognize the US was in fact the Kingdom of Morocco. While the US did partake in naval battles along with Sweden and Sicily against North African pirates during the Barbary Wars, most interaction between the US and the Middle East was minimal. This would change drastically after World War II as President Eisenhower would issue a doctrine 
that would call for the protection and aid of any Middle Eastern nation threatened by the USSR, primarily for oil. The USA at the time was extracting a lot of hydrocarbon resources, but that peak oil was knocking on its door. This is an important issue as much of the military relies on hydrocarbon resources, most notably oil, in order to fuel their engines for its ships, aircrafts, tanks, and hummers. And oh boy, do they require a lot of gas. This can create a vicious cycle, as the United States needs oil to prop up its military, but the need for oil to prop up its military might also result in engaging in military interventions, which have been less than stellar. Eisenhower also forced Britain, France, and Israel to halt their invasion of Egypt during the 1950s. After Nasser, the president of Egypt at the time, nationalized the Suez Canal. This event marked the end of Britain and France's superpower status. It also led to the Israelis shifting their interests away from Britain and towards the United States. The United States holds strong ties with Israel over defense and high-tech matters. Israel kind of operates as a giant US aid black hole as well. Just look up the numbers, they're pretty staggering. In response to US support for Israel during the Yom Kippur War, many OPEC nations set up an embargo on the US and other NATO allies, leading to lines at gas stations during the 1970s that would dwarf those of modern-day Costco. Relations between Israel and its Arab neighbors have improved over the years. The US brokered a peace agreement between Israel and Egypt under President Jimmy Carter during the 1970s. During the 90s, Bill Clinton brokered a peace between Israel and Jordan and the Palestinian Authority. And during the Trump administration, Israel forged formal ties with the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan. Israel and Saudi Arabia are also kind of undercover allies given their mutual hostility to Iran. In the aftermath of the OPEC crisis, the US sought to forge stronger ties with Saudi Arabia, the leader of the Sunni Muslim world, and home to Mecca and Medina. The nation is a regional power with close relations to most Gulf countries, and even closer relations to numerous terrorist groups. Current tension in the Middle East primarily resides between the ongoing struggle between Saudi Arabia and Iran, of which the US has firmly been in the Saudi side. Iran used to be backed by the United States under the Shah, who himself was installed by an American-slash-British-backed coup. This coup overthrew Mossadegh, who was trying to nationalize the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, also known as British Petroleum, or BP. You might be familiar with this company if you live in the Gulf Coast, and especially if you're a pelican. The two nations broke relations in 1979, after a coup overthrew the Shah, the new government was led by Shia militants who were vehemently anti-Western and anti-Soviet. Despite being over 40 years ago, the US and Iran still maintain highly contentious relations, particularly over Iran's nuclear program. Iran insists that its nuclear program is for peaceful purposes, but many other countries contest this. The United States also maintains close relations with Turkey, a NATO member, although it differs over the treatment of Kurds. Turkey also maintains close ties with Qatar, which holds one of the largest concentrations of US military forces abroad. Qatar itself is pretty fascinating, as despite its tiny size, it's home to the largest news network in the Middle East, Al Jazeera, and also had a kind of a quasi-minor major spat with Saudi Arabia a while back, but it's mostly been solved. Look it up. Moving on to a region in which the US has been less active in, Sub-Saharan Africa. This is a part of the world where nations only threw off the yoke of European imperialism as late as the 50s, 60s, and even 70s. Despite this part of the world having an astonishing amount of mineral wealth, including rare earth metals, it is, as we all know, one of the poorest, if not the poorest. While American NGOs are highly active in the region, its military presence has not been particularly great. 
The American African Command is located in Germany for some reason. Nonetheless, there has been an increase in American military presence on the continent, probably due to 1. fighting various Islamic terrorist groups, 2. the large role African economies are going to play in the future, particularly when it comes to providing raw materials, and 3. to act as a counterbalance with China. Further east lies the Indian subcontinent, with a population larger than that of the entire Western Hemisphere. Throughout much of the Cold War, India, despite being the de facto leader of the supposedly neutral not aligned movement, had slightly cold relations with the US, preferring the USSR, while Pakistan on the other hand clung closer to the United States. US-Indian relations became much warmer during the aftermath of the September 11th attacks. India, after all, had been a major target of Islamic terrorists for quite a while now, and since the US joined that club, the two naturally became friendly. India also has a large diaspora population in the United States that is astonishingly successful, with widespread ties in academia, business, science, technology, and culture, which have brought the two nations closer, despite not having any strong military ties. Relations with Pakistan, on the other hand, have not been that great. While Pakistan cooperated with the United States after September 11th, given the Afghanistan war, this was short-lived, as we later found out that bin Laden was chilling with his weed and porn practically next door from Pakistan's West Point. And Pakistan has not been completely thrilled about the use of flying death robots in their territory. The last major region and likely to be the most important during the remainder of the century is the Asia-Pacific. It won't come to a surprise that the main geopolitical adversary here is the People's Republic of China. Relations between the two countries have been fairly frosty ever since the Chinese Communist Party defeated the Nationalists in 1949. The Nationalists, by the way, fled to Taiwan, also known as the Republic of China, which retains close military and economic relations with the US even though it isn't formally recognized with the US and most countries for that matter, mostly because it pisses off the People's Republic of China. The main issues of contention between the US and China are disputes over intellectual property, currency manipulation, China's opposition to Western military intervention, Chinese creation of artificial islands, Chinese support for North Korea, its authoritarian government, and its suppression of Uyghurs and Tibetans. Nonetheless, the two countries maintain very close economic ties as the US has the largest export market for Chinese goods. The demand for cheap labor is part of the reason why jobs are being shipped overseas. China, on the other hand, holds a lot of US debt. Despite their grievances with each other, the US and China are essentially two Siamese twins bound by the wallet. While more recent trade wars have led to a damper on this interconnectedness, it's unlikely to completely get rid of this, which probably makes wars between the two, at least on a massive scale, rather unlikely, although not impossible. To the east lies Japan, the US's most important ally in the Asia-Pacific region. Despite grievances over World War II, the US occupation of Japan was relatively successful in developing democratic institutions and a strong diversified economy. Today, Japan is the third largest economy and home to one of the US's most strategic military bases in Okinawa. The two have numerous ties in technology, science, military cooperation, culture, finance, and manufacturing. Japan can't declare war under its own constitution and primarily relies on the US for defense. However, in recent years, Japanese nationalists have sought to strengthen the role of the military in foreign policy. The next most important ally in the region is South Korea, which also holds a large US military presence. This is due to the fact that the US kicked out the Japanese during World War II from the South, and also thwarted a Chinese-slash-North Korean invasion. The US initially backed a dictatorship in South Korea, and the country remained fairly impoverished for the first few decades after the split, albeit far better off than the North which was supported by the Soviet Union and China. Nonetheless, American land reform and defense assurances did help the South Koreans. These defense assurances exist primarily due to, you guessed it, North Korea, 
a nation that is utterly hilarious to anyone outside its borders, but for some reason, no one within the country is in on the joke. The two Koreas are technically still at war. This is due to the fact that the Korean War ended in a ceasefire rather than a peace treaty, and the demilitarized zone is perhaps the most militarized on the planet, to this day. During the 2000s, the North Koreans developed a nuclear weapons program, which can hit Japan, South Korea, and Guam. Or at least they say so. The development of nukes is most likely going to be used, or is being currently used, as a deterrent measure to halt any potential U.S. attack. But who knows, this is the same country that claims their leaders don't take literal shits. In order to prevent nuclear proliferation, the U.S. has set up a nuclear umbrella over South Korea and Japan in order to protect them against any North Korean attack. The Philippines lies in Southeast Asia and was once a U.S. colony after the Spanish-American War. The U.S. fought against Filipino nationalists in a rather brutal conflict. Nonetheless, relations improved as they fought together in World War II, including an occupation by Japan. Today, the Philippines is one of the most pro-U.S. nations on Earth in terms of its public diplomatic corps and military. However, their current leader is kind of a wild card. The other core U.S. ally in the Pacific is Australia. The U.S. is Australia's biggest defense partner since the Battle of the Coral Sea and its only ally to participate in every major U.S. military intervention since World War II. However, this also places Australia in a difficult position as its most important economic partner is China, despite its defense, political, and cultural ties to the United States. The U.S. also holds very close ties with New Zealand, however, there have been some issues particularly over New Zealand's nuclear-free status. Unlike Europe, where the U.S. maintains a multilateral alliance, NATO, in the Asia-Pacific region, on the other hand, the U.S. operates on a hub-and-spoke system, in which each nation maintains a close military tie with the United States, but not necessarily with each other. The U.S. is the hub, while Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines, Australia, New Zealand, and numerous Pacific Island nations you probably never heard of make up the spokes. In more recent years, some nations like Indonesia, Malaysia, and even Vietnam are starting to become spokes in and of themselves. This is also known as the San Francisco system. Part of the reason for this series of bilateral relations is that while many of these nations fear China and have strong ties to the United States, they don't necessarily get along with one another. For example, there's a high degree of anti-Japanese sentiment in South Korea over war crimes in World War II. So I hope that wraps up a general breakdown of American history, geography, and foreign relations. In my next video, I want to go over the political, military, economic, and cultural affairs that will determine whether or not the U.S. will maintain its status as the world's sole superpower. Thanks for watching.